my name is Nasya. I'm the community manager at Belong. Uh, we are a social venture that focuses on promoting diversity and inclusion in cities, societies, and organization organizations. The Belong Book Club session today um, is being held to mark the second anniversary of. Uh, striking down of the three, Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, uh, the judgment that was passed by the Supreme Court of India on 6th of September in 2018, decriminalizing homosexuality after almost uh, two decades of legal battle and maybe 158 years of injustice, at least according to the Indian Penal Code. Um, so we have with us Saurav Kirpal, uh, who, is, who has been practicing law at the Supreme Court of India for almost two decades now. He was also the counsel for Navte Johar and Ritu Dalmia and others in the 2018 uh, Supreme Court judgment. And uh, he recently edited uh, the book Sex and the Supreme Court. I have it with I have it with me today right now, uh, which is published by Hachette India. Uh, the book is a collection of essays documenting some of the rulings that have set standard for the rights and liberties of sexual minorities and women in India. Hi, Saurabh. How are you doing? Hi, Nasya. Lovely meeting you online, virtually. <laughs> Uh, so before I ask you more serious or deep dive into the questions about the book, I actually want to understand um, what was the process of uh, editing this book like? Where did the idea originate? And what is the pro thought process behind this collection of essays, which is, uh, which is not only legal uh, people who are uh, from the profession, but also uh, several others who it, who it has impacted? Right. So I suppose I can break that question down in two sections as to why this topic and why this format, right? As regards this topic, uh, for the want of a better word, it was topical. Uh, the same constitution bench which struck down section 377, actually read it down, also delivered a few other judgments in the same year. Uh, this very same five judges. So the adultery judgment, the Shabrimala judgment, and while these judgments made news, there was a common factor in all of this, which I think hadn't been explored or recognized by either the media or, or the public at large, which was that all these issues really related to gender, sex, sexuality, etc. Uh, so I thought it was important to cover a book which had a whole range of diverse ideas of the nature of sex, right? Uh, it's a word that's used in Article 15. We'll come, probably come to it later in the, in the discussion. But the generic idea of sex, including sexuality, gender, and how it manifests itself in the decisions of the Supreme Court was something that hadn't been done or attempted before. So I was interested in doing that. Now, as regards the format, I suppose I could have been vain and written the whole thing myself. A, no one would want to read it because who wants to read me? Uh, but more importantly, I thought that a lot of uh, articles and which appear in media, while faintly acquainted with the law, I don't think gave a correct and true perspective of exactly what the Supreme Court had decided. So it was important to give legal knowledge uh, in a kind of a lay format to a person, or an ordinary person. And I also wanted to include in that human stories. You see, law by itself can be a bit dry, a bit arcane. Uh, I can talk about a judgment, I can read passages. And yes, like an opera, there will be an aria, one high moment, which is a quotable quote, so to say, in a judgment. Yeah. But the rest of the judgment is often ignored when the media is reporting on it. Right. So I wanted to get kind of a holistic, broad perspective on the entire judgment. And that's not possible by just a lawyer's perspective on it. Yeah. We needed to get the perspective of those people who are actually affected by the judgments themselves. So for that reason, I thought it was a good idea to take certain petitioners or people who had been closely affected by each of the judgments or the issues I have dealt with in the book. So there are four people, four uh, non-lawyers uh, who have written for this book. Uh, two of them are from the LGBT, well, all three of them are from the LGBT community and one, Namita Bhandare, has written, I think, a fantastic piece uh, on the Me Too movement of India. Uh, so that was really the reason for this uh, decision. Right. Uh, that actually, um, uh, I, w I was actually going to come back to the question of uh, legal jargon. Uh, right. but I I'll reserve that for later. Um, but then other, the other thing I wanted to ask you, since you mentioned uh, quotes uh, that media often captures, that uh, what I personally felt reading your book was uh, you were also trying to capture this 
uh, I don't know if the word is change, but the change in the way the judgments were being passed, for instance, the individual's rights, right? So, um, and also something, the underlying theme of your book could also be borrowed from this one particular quote, I'm sorry for falling prey to this, uh, that comes, which is also happens to be my favorite, that comes from the section 377 judgment, which says uh, social morality cannot be uh, used to violate the fundamental rights of an individual. Uh, constitutional morality cannot be martyred at the altar of social morality, right? So um, the theme of your book is largely constitutional morality, social morality, and the rights of the individual, if I'm interpreting it right, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and uh, this has been uh, showcased via several essays, whether it is while talking about the Kha Panchayats or adultery or Sabarimala judgment. Um, I'd like you to actually elaborate on this a little more, on these concepts within these contexts a little more, if you can. Well, I think, uh, okay, let me step back a bit. And when I said earlier that there are these phrases, I think uh, it's inevitable that there will be these cliched phrases which actually get over passage of time elevated to something more than just cliches, you know. I think these words capture the essence of the decision. My concern earlier when I said was that we should not rest just on the cliches. Yeah. Cliches are all these adages or yeah. these important uh, statements. Yeah. We need to go beyond that a bit. And coming back to the issue of constitutional morality, I think what's important in my book uh, is the focus on the individual. You know, the constitution makers in 1950 had a choice of going down either of two paths. Yeah. One, they could have chosen the rights of the community as paramount and superior to that of any individual. In fact, something akin to that was suggested by Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, of course, that was not adopted by the constitution makers. And instead, a focus was really on individual rights. So part three of the constitution, which gives fundamental rights, are largely about the individual and the individual's relationship with the state and to a very limited extent, the individual relationship with the community. And in all of that, that is a kind of a spirit and ethos of the protection of the individual. So when the courts talk of constitutional morality, you know, it's a kind of a broad concept. And I fear sometimes it means everything to everybody. Uh, so when you have to give some substance to what this rather compendious term of constitutional morality is because we have to, in law, when we argue matter in court, give meanings to words, right? We can't just bandy them about. But I think constitutional morality has very real substance. And I think for, first and foremost, what it means is adherence to part three of the constitution. That is adherence to the respect of fundamental rights of the individual. That above all is the soul of the constitution. It's something that even uh, uh, B.R. Ambedkar said uh, that Article 32 is the soul of the Constitution. Uh, the Supreme Court on numerous occasions have said that there's a golden triangle of rights, the right to equality, the right to freedom of expression and other freedoms, and the right to life. Yeah. So constitutional morality for me means protection of fundamental rights and the enhancement and the ability of the individual to fulfill her or his own potential completely. So that's the idea of constitutional morality. And that is several facets to it. Uh, how the individual reacts with the community is, I suppose, the basic theme of my book. So when you talk of, say, the Shabri Mala judgment, uh, of course, Mukul has written a chapter, Mukul Rodhi has written a chapter on uh, Shabri Mala, where he probably takes a contrarian view uh, to the rest of the book. The rest of the book is supporting all the judgments and saying they're, they're liberal. Mukul takes a slightly different view, but I felt it's important to keep it. With, and again, something we can come to it. It's his view and it's as valid as any other. Yeah. The issue, however, is how does the right of an individual, i.e. a woman, entering into a temple to pray to the deity she believes in, clash with a right of the community to hold their own beliefs of their own religion? Hmm. There is, in a sense, a clash really between the rights of the individual, i.e. the woman, and the community, which is the religious group. And I think often the question is not framed in those terms. It's seen as a right of the woman, and that's it. And that's important also to understand that there is a clash, really, the community and the individual. And the same thing in the Kap Panchayat uh, judgment that you mentioned. 
uh, it's the right of the individual to marry versus the so-called or the alleged, I don't believe that they have a right, but the so-called right of a community to maintain its social integrity or its religious integrity. So when a community says there will be no inter, uh, inter-caste marriage or inter-religion marriage or same go through marriage, it's a community asserting itself. And then there is again two individuals saying, no, we wish to marry. So there is then a clash again of the individual and the community. So that's, I think, a tension that the court has to resolve. And that's a balance I think the court has sought to do by these judgments. And paramount in all these findings, was the value of the individual trumping the value or the needs of the community at each occasion. Because really to fulfill the goal of building a better community, we can't ignore the individual. It's only by putting the individual at the center of the constitutional firmament that you can actually hope to develop a community as a more just egalitarian ideal society, which are constitution makers envisaged. Right. I actually have a follow-up question to that, which comes from your book. Um, I remember reading at some point where there was a discussion about uh, what the parliament is passing versus what the Supreme Court is passing, right? And um, why? And that actually stands. Uh, that that that's actually not consistent if we see the way it is. Whether whether if we look at it from the LGBTQ uh, rights or the Section three seventy seven judgment, or maybe. For triple talaq, on the other hand, it's 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 something else, right? So how how do you explain what the parliament is supposed to be passing versus what the Supreme Court is supposed to be uh, judging? I think uh, we must accept the fact that parliament is political. Uh, they are meant to act in the interests of the country as a whole. They elected, they take oath of office to the constitution. But we forget that at the end of the day, they are politicians and they will only do that which is politically expedient and not necessarily that which is correct. Uh, check on them doing something is every five years by way of election. But the other check which the constitution makers imposed was that of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is come to majoritarian. They're not supposed to bother about what the vast majority mean, needs or wants because if you want to protect the individual, right? Who does the individual need protection from? They typically need it, as I said before, they need protection from either the state or they need protection from the community. Yeah. And the community is the majority. majority right. So if you want to protect individual rights, you need to protect an individual from the majority. Right. And we can't expect parliament to do that, uh, realistically, uh, at least in the Indian context. I don't think parliament has often stepped up and done the right thing. And this has been true of parliament from 1950 onwards. I would not uh, say this is particularly novel. It may be more acute in certain times of the development of the country, but it's always been the case. So it's really the role of the Supreme Court to be the guardian and right at the forefront of protection of the fundamental rights. Because it's not the individual who can do it themselves. They need to go to be able to knock at the doors of the Supreme Court and say, I was promised this right by the constitution and you were appointed the guardian and I ask you and I beseech you to, to protect it. And as an example where there's, a, there's this kind of attention is, as you said, section 377, the LGBT rights itself in Kaushal's case on the 11th of December, 2013, the Supreme Court said, we can't strike down section 377, it's a parliament to do. And I think in doing so, they completely abdicated the constitutional responsibility. Uh, so I think in 2018, when in Nafte Johar, the court said, no, it's our responsibility and Koshal was wrong, they stepped up and accepted their constitutional obligation. Yeah. Remember, I said earlier that parliamentarians and MPs take an oath of office. Yeah. So do the judges of the Supreme Court. And for them, it's imperative and they have been sworn to uphold the values of the constitution. And one of them is protection of individual rights. And no one else in our scheme of things, in our constitutional scheme, can protect individual rights better than the Supreme Court. And I think it's not merely a case of uh, them being our guardians. I think it's their constitutional duty to do so. Right. We're not expecting too much as citizens when we demand from the Supreme Court that it steps in and protects our right. right. It's why they were appointed. Yeah. 
uh, that actually uh, flows into the next question and it was about interpretation and the changing interpretation and I was actually speaking with Parmesh earlier today and we were discussing uh -huh. his book Viristan and uh, we spoke about how change can come in from different directions right whether it is society that's pushing for change and then the lawmakers take it upon themselves or the, or the court takes it upon themselves or it could start with a law where uh, the court rules something and then society starts changing accordingly uh, and putting that in the three you also uh, speak about how um, the law is shaped by society and in turn shapes it right in the sex in the supreme court so i want to understand spe specifically with respect to the 377 judgment and the several judgments that were passed um, not just by the supreme court but also by the delhi high court earlier um, how do you map the uh, differential changes in the judgment um, uh, and is, how far is the interpretation of the constitution changing through through these judgments uh, by the Supreme Court alone? Is it, is, it, is it in all cases respecting the individual rights or is it also getting uh, propelled or uh, influenced by the society's dialogue at large? An interesting question. And while I have reflected somewhat on it in the book, I think the, it's a slow dance really between society and the court. Uh, the court is meant to act impartially and lay down what the constitution says, irrespective of what society wants and public opinion wants. But I think to expect the public opinion to be very far away from the court's sensibilities or conscious, uh, consciousness, it is answer to conscience, is also probably not correct. So I think there's kind of a slow tango that happens between public opinion and uh, the court's judgment. But there are certain breakthrough moments. Uh, so you mentioned the Section 377 judgment in the High Court. Now, that's a prime example of it, where the court actually broke away from what public opinion was. Yeah. I think in 2009, you're sitting at a distance of 11 years, and a large part of the audience who's young, the millennials, probably don't know, would not have any idea of how tough it was to be yeah. a member of the LGBT community in 2009 or even before. And we didn't have uh, social media allyship also back then. Yeah. Absolutely. There was, there was no social media. I mean, can you imagine that? There was a time like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? There was even a time before internet. I remember it. Uh, so it was a time of deep regressiveness within society. Uh, even the government of the time, uh, which is otherwise theoretically meant to be a liberal government, 2009 to the Congress, UPA1, UPA1. Uh, actually opposed the decriminalization of uh, Section 377. So I think the court had two brave warriors and stalwarts, uh, Justice E.P. Shah and Justice Murlidhar. And I think the community, the LGBT community, owes them a great debt of gratitude right. because they stepped up and they took the jurisprudence of the court and elevated it. You see, constitutional jurisprudence is about incremental growth. Hmm. You take a constitutional precept and you give life to it by increasing it scope the right of uh, the scope of the right to different multifarious situations as and when it develops but that incremental growth is often slow by its very nature but in 2009 there was a virtual revolution i think yeah. uh, it was a judgment which gave a uh, breathed life into some of the fundamental rights uh, in a way that had not been done before and ultimately was true to the spirit of the constitution or what as often said constitutional morality so i think what's important in all these judgments has been even in uh Shabri Mala, in the adultery judgment uh, in vishakha in its time i think that's another judgment that i've, I've covered in uh, that has been covered in the book in 1997 uh, the idea of forming a committee for uh, sexual harassment and making it apply not just to the government, but to even individual uh, companies was a revolutionary idea. Yeah. I think now it's become, we become blase about it. But if we put it in the historical context, it was uh, quite a revolutionary idea. So I think the growth of constitutional jurisprudence, of course, is incremental, but we need these revolutionary pushes once in a while to breathe life into these uh, articles. Now, of course, uh, I think if you overindulge and you uh, overexpand a certain idea of a right, there will be a backlash, right? If you put things into a content of right which don't rightly belong there, 
uh, there will be kind of a step back either by the correctional mechanism of appeals itself in the court or maybe by society. So courts therefore have to be slightly careful about how they rule and decide. And this is what I was referring to earlier as some kind of the slow tangle of the court of public opinion and the court of law. Okay, uh, brilliant. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, my other question would actually be uh, a little less about the subject matter itself, but more uh, broadly about how the book has managed to say what it wants to say, which is basically, uh, uh, when I saw the book, it said sex in the Supreme Court, right? And I was slightly wary of whether I will understand the jargon. Uh, but uh, when once I started getting into it, it was it was beautiful interpretation of everything that I wanted to understand, right? Whether it is breaking down the 497 or uh, breaking down the or speaking about the judgment of the three, uh, 377 itself. Uh, what kind of measures did you take to make it understandable to a uh, novice or amateur reader? like me or anybody else out there what what effort did go, go went in there and i'm not saying uh, uh, with respect to all of you who wrote chapters as well and uh, of course keshav suri's etc was more easy to understand but uh, more emotionally uh, charged and it was nice to read but uh, the others were so informative and enriching so what effort went in there ah it was uh, an effort of omission more than commission uh, okay. it, it's easy for a lawyer who's used to speaking to another lawyer or a judge to start using jargon. Right. Because ultimately jargon is a sort of a tool of our trade, right? So when I use a particular word, say constitutional morality, another lawyer would immediately understand that. Right. Or if I say article drop, you know, random sections or articles. So it's kind of a code of speaking which shortens discussions. Right. Uh, so that's what jargon often is. And it's kind of necessary in our profession because I have to start explaining everything de novo, i.e. example, from the beginning, uh, people will just uh, will waste time because they already know this jargon. Right. So I think it's important for us to realize that we had to use accessible language hmm. without dumbing down the content. Right. Now that was very, very important for us. It's easy to make the book into kind of a media article where we just give general gyan, so to say. Right. We didn't want that to happen. We wanted actually a legal decision to be interpreted and conveyed to uh, a, a, the common man or woman, uh, but not really lose the nuances, etc. But I'm a great believer in the philosophy that you can convey nuance in simple language. Uh, ultimately, that which is inaccessible about the law and the court is the nature of the language we use, really. Uh, and it's a peculiarly common law phenomena or an Indian phenomena. Because if you read the judgments of the US Supreme Court, uh, they are not so inaccessible. Uh, they use simple language, they use uh, ideas which are accessible to every person. And I think that's how it should be, right. because if the Supreme Court is meant to hold the moral high ground and is expected to command respect, it should also expect that its judgments should be read by the common person mm -hmm. and they should be able to comprehend it. Right. I think lately uh, it's become somewhat of a poetry competition in the, uh, in the Supreme Court and while there was a brilliance of Krishnaya in the 70s who could use language in many, many ways, I am afraid that some of his skill has been lost with the passage of time. Right. Uh, and judgments have become inaccessible. Right. They become verbose, they have become prolix, they have become long, they have become obscure. So that was the intention of this book, is to make those judgments accessible to the common person. And you can't make them accessible by using the same language. Right. The very thing that makes them inaccessible is not something we can employ in our book. Right. So that was a brief that I requested of each of the authors to, to do. Right. And where they strayed from the brief, uh, one had to kind of do guillotine and reworking. And you, the idea is not to avoid complicated concepts. Yeah. The idea is to explain those complicated concepts in a simple term. And that's the skill of a lawyer, I think. A good lawyer should be able to explain complicated things easily. Right. Uh, 
and not to uh, treat your reader as as an idiot. Right. I, I, so that's that's been very that's very important for us is to see that the reader is a thinking person who we should engage and inform in a way that's possible. Yeah, definitely. And also starts, uh, it also gets you to think so much more, I think, uh, just reading it. Uh, it's not just the thought process that's put in you, but also the fact that it propels that thought process in you. Further. Um, and that's actually, um, actually, my next question was slightly, uh, uh, I'm, I'm taking this from your book, but it's also uh, about the larger context of judgments, uh, of the Judgment 377 in particular, since we're talking about that today. Uh, so Keshav Suri in his essay at some point wrote, we have not destroyed boundaries between us and them, but we've blurred them because of the 377, uh, 6 September 2018 judgment. Um, so when we were considering, um, you, we, were to, you, we were talking about how, uh, this has to be incremental and equal rights are something that need, um, that we need to et eternally push for. Uh, from a legal standpoint, do you think this was a destruction of boundaries or do you think this was a blurring of boundaries? Uh, personal opinion. Yeah, my personal opinion is, uh, I don't think there's that much destruction, difference between destruction and blurring, okay. right? Uh, how do you destroy something? You start by, in, in, in law, you start by erasing it, right? right. You can't say that, they are no longer us and them. Right. And also, I'm not sure that I necessarily want that to happen, right? Uh, I think we must rejoice our differences. Uh, so, there will be the boundaries of us and them. The question is, what do we mean by blurring of boundaries and which boundaries? So, here I suppose I'd say, in the eyes of law, in the formal eyes of the law, as a citizen, I should be viewed at the same manner as a heterosexual person. Any trans person should be viewed as any other lesbian gay uh, person. And that is the blurring of the boundaries that I want, right? And I think the court has begun that uh, idea of blurring the boundaries by striking down Section 377. Of course, a lot remains to be done. Yeah. But in another way, I don't want our boundaries to be blurred, which is I want to celebrate the differences. Uh, I don't want this kind of a homogeneous society. The idea of a rainbow society is important. And therefore, you must retain these boundaries as well uh, between us and them. So as to celebrate it, right? Uh, not a purpose of building a boundary so that uh, we are removed from each other, but to stay within our own selves as well and, and be able to rejoice without any fear of the law. Uh, so... So it's, it's not as easy as, as one or the other. And I think that's another case of nuance, which we expect as lawyers to have. And that's something we hope to convey through this book. Uh, so blurring of the boundaries, has it happened? Yes. Uh, is it always a good thing? Yes and no. And destruction of boundaries, that certainly has not happened. And okay. that's not. So um, that actually um, brings me to the last question, but it's a long one. We can uh, also consider, uh, the question is a long one. So um, generally uh, the basic point of, the, of this question is uh, speaking about the way forward and what the next step should be. And um, it's a wide, the wide public dialogue is that the next step, step should be uh, marriage, right? The right to marry, um, the same sex marriage or, or, and what kind of hurdles do, legal hurdles do such things po uh, pose because uh, uh, there's something I'm drawing from your book as well. Um, marriage again is something that's steeped in religious laws. So yeah. where, and there's, there's an entire discussion in your book about how uh, one thing clashes with the other and then how do you come, uh, come to that judgment, especially when it's a religious situation involved and we already spoke about Sabari Malan and Triple Talak. So how, 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 how do you think the hurdles are going to be for say, if, if we think marriage is the next step to the legal acceptance of, uh, L for homosexuality or LGBTQ community. And, uh, the next part of that question is how far do you see us going with the LGBTQ inclusion agenda in the next decade or so legally? I'll take the second part of your question first, if you allow me, because I think that's important. I don't necessarily think that marriage is the next big thing. Uh, right. Marriage is very important to some people and right. I'll come to that later. But I think there are a lot more important things. I think the most important thing, and that's something that's going to be the agenda for the next 10 years, is anti-discrimination. Uh, 
Um, yeah. Forget the LGBT community, even for women. Uh, right. You know, there's no anti discrimination code in this country. Right. It's been 70 years since independence. And uh, one private citizen can discriminate against another private citizen on the ground of their sex. Uh, and I find that absolutely appalling. Uh, and there is no legal protection. So I think the next battle will be anti discrimination because you can get married. But that won't help very much if you don't have a job, mm -hmm. if you don't have housing, if uh, you're excluded from restaurants and bars, okay. uh, if you are not allowed to have insurance uh, yeah. along with your partner or anybody else. So these daily discriminations that are faced uh, have to be dealt with. In the case of the trans community, I think the problem is even more severe. Yeah. With the new transgender bill, I think, which is deeply, deeply problematic. So I think that's something that will have to be fought. These battles will have to be fought. And since I mentioned about the anti-discrimination code for women, I, that's an example I can take again. The constitution gave formal equality to women in 1950. Right. It's been 70 years, right? I don't think we're very, very close to true equality. Right. So I think the path ahead is a long and an arduous one. And in the next 10 decades, I see us constantly pushing the doors of the court. Right. I don't think Parliament is going to step up and do anything. Yeah. But we'll have to build up a jurisprudence and a body of case law. And we see that happening already. Uh, we see everyday judgments coming from various courts, protecting uh, couples, recognizing LGBT rights. I'm looking forward to a time when this becomes kind of blasé, you know, yeah. when you enter into a court. I and mean, those of us who practice in the high courts or the Supreme Court are used to entering a, a criminal uh, court or a division bench where the judges are seeking to protect uh, a young married couple who recently eloped yeah. uh, and inevitably they're men and women. But I'm looking forward, forward to a time when we enter and there are two men or two women or trans uh, people and no one raises an eyebrow. You know? yeah. so, but we have a way to go to that. But that's the second part of your question. So the path ahead is, I think, largely anti-discriminatory law. Coming on the first part of your question about gay marriage, uh, and here again, I'd say, that I think the fight for equality and rights for the LGBT community is not necessarily compartmentalized. Right. So while it's important to push for anti-discrimination, I think that's more important. Right. It doesn't mean we can't simultaneously push for the idea of gay marriage. Yeah. Because as you said, marriage is a religious thing in our yeah. country. It's also a social thing. Right. Uh, and I was speaking to some friends of mine and they were saying, pointing out that, that, thing, that uh, you know, in India, every parent's biggest dream is right? right? It's really the heartfelt, emotive idea of any parent. Yeah. So it's not merely a social thing. It's a societal thing that you've really accomplished one of your major goals in life by getting married. Right. So if you don't permit gay marriage, you're actually restraining people from not achieving that social goal. Right. And to all those people who think that I don't want to get married, a lot of LGBT activists say that, oh, gay marriage is not important and uh, it's unnecessary and uh, we don't believe in the concept of marriage in any case. Yeah. I think you're very divorced from a very large number of Indians. Let's, let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, most people want to get married. You may not want to, it's your choice, of course, you to get married. But a very large number of people uh, do want to get married. Yeah. So how do we go about it? We'll have to move court again. Uh, in a country where Section 377 could not be read down or repealed. The very idea of not sending someone to jail for life could not be repealed by parliament. Yeah. We expect the idea of a progressive thing like gay marriage to happen right. to parliament is impossible. Right. Right? So it's going to be through, through court. Uh, whether that's directly through the Supreme Court or whether the high courts do it, is I think somewhat a matter of strategy. Uh, I think sometimes the common audience doesn't understand or appreciate how much of what we do in court is about strategy. Because right. judges sitting there are uh, personnel who are shaped by their ideas, their upbringing, their system from society as well. Right. So which court we move at what point with what ideas is, is not something A might openly discuss. B, also not predict, I think, uh, but it's, it's, 
it's a very difficult and involved question. Right. Uh, so I think some of that will be determined as to what the constitution of the court is at some point in the future. Uh, when we choose to move, uh, it will also be a case if uh, several high courts start hearing the matter, maybe the government will ask the Supreme Court to hear the matter, bring everything up to itself. The matter will be ultimately settled at the level of the Supreme Court. Right. Of course. Either by an Article 32 petition, i.e. in the Supreme Court directly, or by way of an appeal from an order of the High Court, the way it was really in the case of uh, Koshal and then uh, in Johar. Yeah. So the Supreme Court will, of course, I ultimately uh, identify it. But what I'm hoping in terms of hurdles, and the hurdle will, of course, be, I think, the government. Uh, and I think to some extent, civil society. Yeah. Because that's the difference I felt and saw so in 2009 in the High Court, in 2013, first time in the Supreme Court, and 2018, the second time in the Supreme Court, is I felt society had changed so much in those 10 years. By the time the judgment of the 2018 came, society had moved on. So yeah. even the government felt uh, it easy not to uh, uh, oppose decriminalization, right? Yeah. Now, I hope a similar kind of process will happen for gay marriage as well. Yeah. We've now on the second anniversary of 2000, uh, of the 377 judgment. And it's quite heartening to see the development that have happened. Uh, I, I know there's a long way to go. But immediately after the 2018 judgment, what I noticed most and what was most telling was silence. Yeah. There, was no, there was no uproar by any religious group. There were no demonstrations. Everyone accepted it. Yeah. And in the last two years, you know, this has seeped into our consciousness. Yeah. Uh, and it's tough for me to say that has it made a change or not? Has the judgment made a change or not? Yes, it has. But if you ask me to give me a simple example, that I may not be able to do. Because unlike the constitutional revolution that happened in court. In society, uh, we don't want revolutions. We don't want guillotines and off with our heads situations. We want yeah. evolutions. Yeah. And that's a slow drip, drip, drip of justice, equality, fraternity, and egalitarianism filtering into the psyche of the common masses through Bollywood movies that they see, yeah. through same-sex couples that they see on uh, television or or their neighborhood, or their friends, their, their uncle, their nephew, their, their brother, their cousin, their friend. I think that is a necessity that, will overcome, that, that, that has to happen because that will enable us to overcome any hurdle. Right. right. So the hurdle which I anticipate society and the government posing can only be undone by spreading the love, so to say, yeah. uh, through society and all of us stepping up as well. Uh, it's not enough for activists to step up and do their job. It's important, of course. But I think if you're human, if you believe in love, you have to step up for everybody else. If you think you're good enough to love somebody else, hey, so is an LGBT person, huh? So you have to step up and, and, and be counted, I think. Yeah. Uh, and here I'm making an impassioned plea to all your audience that if there is a member of the uh, LGBT community in your in your family uh, or your friend, don't just silently support them. Overtly and openly support them. Yeah, yeah. Go out to gay marches, go out to demonstrations, make yourself be heard. Yeah. It's no good being a silent majority because the silent majority rarely wins because we won't have a chance to vote, right? So we won't know if you're in the majority. Yeah. Make yourself heard. It's okay to be out and proud and loud, but you can be loud without being out. Yeah. So I really beseech everybody that it's not enough to think the right thing. Right. You must go out and do the right thing. Right. right? That's, that's my request that's, to all of you and your viewers. Yeah, that, that's actually the best way I could think of that this could end. Thank you so much, Saurabh. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Lasa. Thank you very, very much. And all of you, please buy the book. It's a great one. Yes. Um, I'm going to actually flash it again. Sure. Yeah. Yes. And the word sex, salacious as it may sound, uh, finds mention in Article 15. So, of course, I had a bit of a tiff with the publishers as to whether we could use something like that on our cover. 
And I said, if it's good enough for the constitution, it's good enough for us. Yeah, there, there are several books out there with uh, sex on the cover, so it's uh, it's fine. Um, I found it yeah. next to uh, I found it next to Sex in the City in the bookstore. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. love, I must say. <laughs> Who can't like Sarah Jessica Parker? We all want to grow up and be her. Yes, <laughs> completely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um,